All right, so we're back with Dr. Manning from Gulf Coast Ice Care and Dr. Austin from Elevate Your Existence. And today we're all about LASIK. Now we just did a video about all the different types of vision correction options. So if you wanna check that out, you can find it in the card above or in the description in the show, show notes below. But today is all about LASIK. So let's go ahead and focus on LASIK surgery with Dr. Manning and Dr. Austin. Dr. Manning has actually done thousands of LASIK procedures in his career, so he would be the perfect person to be asking these questions about what is LASIK, how does it work, how, does it, how did it come about, and what makes it such a safe procedure today? So Dr. Manning, can you give us a quick rundown or a quick idea of how LASIK came about as far as the history of it? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so with LASIK, uh, some of the, the origins of LASIK and the first idea of reshaping the cornea go back all the way to uh, as far back as about the 1950s uh, in Colombia, a doctor by the name of Jose Barraker uh, first started doing some, some corneal reshaping procedures. Um, now the use of a, an eczema laser to reshape the cornea really didn't end up happening uh, till about 1989 with uh, Marguerite McDonald, uh, and that was sort of the beginnings of PRK. Um, as, as we proceed into the 90s, um, in the later 90s, 1998, 1999 was when the FDA finally approved uh, the lasers that are used uh, in, in modern LASIK. Um, of course, they've gone through many generations of design change since that time. Uh, and so that also includes evolution where in the earliest days of LASIK, uh, a device called the microkeratome was used, uh, which was a little oscillating blade that created the flap for LASIK, uh, where in more modern LASIK, we use all lasers for, for the procedure. So Dr. Austin, what are some of the signs that you would pick up from your patient that says, uh, I think I wanna to talk to this person about LASIK? Yeah, so one of the first things that I do whenever I you know, go in to see a patient is try to get an understanding of, you know, what are they doing on their regular day-to-day -day basis and how are they really using their eyes? And from there, we kind of formulate a plan as to what's going to work best for them. Somebody that comes in and let's say that they are an athlete and they're out, you know, pretty often, um, but they don't want to wear contact lenses, you know, you're looking for different things that actually can indicate that they may be a good candidate for that procedure. You know, you hear somebody that says, you know, I've been wearing glasses for 10 years, but I really don't like wearing them and I'm looking for something different, um, but I hate putting contact lenses in my eye. I hate the idea of poking my eye. Those are the types of things where you want to say, okay, this is going to be the perfect option for you. We can get you into, you know, LASIK and get that considered. And in many cases, most patients, especially with LASIK being so popular nowadays, they come in and ask directly for it. You know, people know what it is, they've heard about it, they know a friend or family member that's had it done. And so they come in and most often it's kind of just inquisitive. They want to get some more information about it. And then our goal is to guide by giving them more information and making them feel more comfortable about the procedure and then setting them up with the right person. Somebody such like Dr. Manning who can really get them taken care of, mm -hmm. answer their questions and really get them taken care of well. All right, and after that, we say, I think this patient will be good for, and then the patient now gets excited about this, and they go see you, Dr. Manning. Uh, what kind of characters are you looking for to say this uh, LASIK would be perfect for this person? Uh, a lot of them are similarities to um, what Dr. Austin's mentioned of um, patients who, who are really looking to uh, free themselves from some of their need for glasses or contacts, um, that, that perhaps they struggle with dry eye issues with their contacts or a number of other things. Um, naturally, we look at candidacy, uh, which groups of patients will be candidates, and you know there are some groups that we do unfortunately have to exclude, and these can include uh, younger patients, so we don't perform LASIK or vision correction procedures generally on patients uh, below age 18. Typically, this is because uh, just like the rest of us is growing, our eyes are growing and changing. Uh, so, so that is one of the requirements. Uh, also, due to changes that can occur, we're uh, not recommending LASIK for patients who are pregnant or nursing, uh, as well as, of course, you know, we have to screen for different conditions that may, may preclude a patient from getting LASIK. And that's also a good point. I like how you said, as far as the kids and our eyes are still growing, we get a lot of kids that 15, 16, 17 saying, you know, I, I don't want to wear glasses. I can't put contacts in my eyes. I want LASIK now. And we explain to them how the eyes stop uh, growing at a certain age. Quick question for you, Dr. Manning. How many years would you say or months of stable vision that you would recommend before choosing an option like LASIK? 
Uh, most would generally recommend six months to a year of stable okay. vision, typically. Um, so that, that's pretty pretty common. Yeah. LASIK is not just for those who are having problems or suffering from some issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if you enjoy wearing contact lenses and you enjoy wearing glasses, but you just want to have that freedom to be able to see the world in your own terms, you know, be able to wake up and not have to worry about doing those things and just kind of live freely, it's a great option for anybody, really. Now. Dr. Austin has also had LASIK himself, so he knows exactly what the experience side of it was. So what I want to ask is, uh, what made you choose LASIK out of all the other options out there? So being presented with all the options, you have PRK, you have LASIK, you have all these other types that can be done. For me, it was really a balance of, you know, what was necessary for my lifestyle, but also recovery time and healing time. You know, LASIK in all uh, considerations is a very secure, very safe and very stable procedure, but the fastest recovery time. PRK is a little bit longer, but you know, you don't have the same flap that gets created like you do with the LASIK procedures. So there's a lot less likely chance of a flap dislocation, you know, in case of something like that. Um, one thing that I also take into consideration as Dr. Shanai has mentioned before, you know, we practice martial arts. And so I wanted to make sure that the procedure that I did was gonna be safe for what I do. Um, being pretty athletic, staying on top of things and living a very active lifestyle, you wanna make sure that the procedure that you do fits what you do. And as far as LASIK goes, the likelihood of you ever having any complications is so small that for me, it just made the most sense. You know, I get clear vision at a much sooner rate and I don't really have to worry about that recovery time. Mm -hmm. Now that you bring up a good point as far as the dislocated uh, lens. Now, again, as doctors, we are not really, we don't like to jump into straight negatives and scare people, but this, uh, there are complications that can happen. Now, I will say as far as LASIK, it's been a lot more widely accepted in the military, law enforcement, and I know in the past it was a little um, taboo, I guess you could say, to do it to someone like that because God forbid they're uh, in a confrontation and all of a sudden now I can't see because I got hit in the eye. But we really haven't been, we haven't seen that in the sense that now I know some branches of the military, they'll actually offer that as an option to some of their people. Is that right? I know that in the earliest days of um, LASIK becoming available, uh, the military was cautious in proceeding and continued doing PRK initially. But as they saw the safety uh, levels with, with research and with studies, uh, it became widely accepted within the military to do LASIK as well. Yeah, yeah. And just to add on to what Dr. Mann was saying and what Dr. Shania was mentioning, you know, as far as the military goes, my older brother, he was a doctor in the military and my father was actually in the military for about 23 years. Both of them had their LASIK procedures done through the military. So as Dr. Shania mentioned, that procedure is definitely much more widely accepted now and if you know you're talking about people who are in you know active line of duty and are wondering about am i going to have something that's going to prevent me from being able to perform my duties if it's good enough for them it should be good enough for anybody now we get a lot of patients who uh wear contacts and there is something that we have to pay attention for that before we can do in the uh go into lasik so dr manning how long do you want uh is it recommended for a patient to stay out of contact for that surgery Great question, yeah. Uh, the whole reason to need to stay out of contacts uh, tends to relate to the uh, fact that the contact lens wear tends to temporarily alter the curvature of the cornea. And so we naturally want the corneal contour to get back to its natural state. Um, so the duration will depend on which type of lenses and the type of wear. Uh, so patients who do soft contact lenses with daily wear where they take them out at night, we tend to recommend that they stay out of them for about a week. Those who do more extended wear where they sleep in their contacts, oftentimes we do longer, probably about two weeks. And then lastly, those who wear gas permeable or hard contact lenses, usually those patients were looking at at least about three weeks or, or more uh, that we'd have them stop them. All right. Now I've had this happen before and I want to ask you if you've had this happen before, but what do you do with that patient who has been wearing contacts, whether soft or hard contacts and just completely hates wearing glasses and they don't even have a pair of glasses at home and they say well i have really really terrible vision without my contacts but i don't have glasses so what do you do in that situation 
So, you know, one of the most common things, especially as you mentioned, it happens pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in order for the surgeons to be able to get an accurate reading and to be able to do that surgery in a way that's going to provide you good long lasting vision, uh, the best thing to do is really have some way of getting you out of those contact lenses for at least that time being. So what we would do at that point is probably coordinate with the surgeon's office and say, you know, we have this patient that's been wearing contact lenses. They don't have any backup glasses. You know, how would you like us to proceed? You may have some situations where they say, you know, just don't have them wear any contact lenses for a certain number of days and we'll try to work around it. Or we may have to delay the actual um, consultation until we get that person a pair of glasses, mm -hmm. have them wear something and just get them out of the contact lenses. But I'd love to hear from you, Dr. Manning, sure. and what you guys normally do. Yeah, um, so it, it may depend on uh, the degree of somebody's or the power of somebody's prescription. Uh, those with a milder prescription, uh, we have seen some at times who simply say, hey, I'm just going to go without and I'll be blurry. And I, I have seen that. Interesting. It's probably not as common, but um, but we see some do that if somebody has a mild enough prescription. Uh, those with higher prescriptions, though, uh, typically we're often making a plan in coordination with, with, with folks like you guys, uh, with the professionals, uh, to get a temporary pair. You know, Unfortunately, I know it's not ideal because the patients say, well, gosh, I'm just going to use these for a short period and I don't need them. You know, sometimes they can have options of, well, could I get the lenses changed to turn them into sunglasses afterwards or something, but, you know, those, those might be options. Um, but uh, but we will still tend to encourage them to get a, a, a short-term pair. Right. I think a lot of it depends on what's your motivation. You know, if you really, if this is something that you feel would be really helpful for your life, then we can think out of the box to make it happen. We have had times where we have made um, I mean, they were the ugliest pair of glasses for this patient because we wanted those glasses back. We didn't want to give someone just a free pair of glasses, but we made it free for them. Uh, it was hideous, mm. but they wore the, the pair of glasses for the two weeks that, so they can get in it, go in and get um, the consultation. But yeah, sometimes we got to think out of the box, but try, get glasses, make it easy on us. All right, so the next question that I found uh, one of our viewers had asked is, if someone can see 2020 uh, in the distance, but they do need reading glasses for up close or that computer, can this person get LASIK uh, to correct that? Because they say 90% 90 of, 90 of their day they're in front of a computer screen. So I just want something like that as opposed to, uh, I'm okay with using glasses for driving instead. Is that something that might be a good option for them or do we want to steer them into something else? Uh, so that, that can still be an option for patients. Okay. Uh, this is something we would tend to hear more commonly, uh, particularly in patients in the 40 plus age range, because uh, just as all people will uh, start to have near vision challenges as we lose uh, our, our zoom function, as our natural lens stiffens, um, this is less typical that we'd hear uh, an issue of this in, in someone below age 40. Um, but, uh, but in any case, um, with patients who have that frustration, uh, they could instead opt to have their vision corrected for a different distance, uh, such as near vision or, or computer vision. Um, others can do uh, what we call blended vision that you, I know you guys are very versed in, where uh, one eye may be uh, continuing to be good distance vision and we don't change anything, where the other eye we may intentionally change to give more near vision. And we find that our brain can adjust to that, even though it sounds strange to have the eyes different we find uh, our brain will adjust uh, to that change. Dr. Austin, because you've already had LASIK, can you explain the emotional side of it? Going from I'm getting ready to, to I'm, I'm laying down on this thing, it's coming closer to my, how did you go through that? And um, maybe a follow-up question to Dr. Manning, what do you do when you have someone who's just very, very anxious and scared? Are you able to, um, what's the best way to calm them down so the sur surgery is successful? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, going into the surgery, it was, you know, an exciting moment, but it's also, you know, a little bit scary. And the whole goal is really, as you understand more about what the surgery is and how it's performed, getting rid of that fear by understanding what it's really about. Um, for myself, you know, I refer patients for LASIK all the time. So when it was time for me to go, I had a pretty good understanding of what to expect, but you never know until you're the one that's in the chair. So uh, going into it, I knew that it was gonna be, you know, a fairly short procedure. The amount of wait time before you actually lay on the table and get the surgery done is longer than probably anything else. Just preparing, going through the consultations, but pretty much starting from your doctor or your optometrist's office, wherever you're beginning, 
they're going to get a refraction on you. They're going to figure out, are you a good candidate? They're going to work kind of hand in hand with the ophthalmologist of your choice to figure out, can we do this procedure on you? And what is that going to look like? And then once you get sent over and it's time to actually get that surgery done, you know, you get set up, they give you something to help you relax if you need it. Um, just as you mentioned earlier, people can get very anxious or scared when a procedure like this is happening because, you know, you only have your one pair of eyes. But our goal as optometrists and as ophthalmologists is to make sure that we take the best care of your eyes, that you're seeing as well as you can, and that you're as healthy as can be. So we take that very seriously. We make sure that we give you all the information that you need to feel comfortable about every step of the procedure as you're moving forward. You're gonna have multiple people walking you through the process as you sit down to get that surgery done. And you know, when I went to go and get that laser surgery done, they showed me the laser suite, the room that it was going to be in. They tell you what the process is going to look like. Um, you can have family members there with you if you need some support. And when you actually sit down and get ready to do that procedure, there really is no pain involved. You'll get a little bit of pressure as the actual procedure is being performed. And Dr. Manny can go into more detail about what that procedure entails, but it really is pretty much pain-free. It's very, very quick and it's very, very safe. Uh, as Dr. Austin was alluding to, one of the more common ways is uh, we do tend to give relaxing medications. So an oral medication that somebody would take uh, that calms the nerves, uh, there you could say that is adjustable in the sense we could give more for those who are more prone to anxiety or panic. Uh, nervousness, very normal. Really, it should be normal that any of us should be nervous to go through a surgery procedure. That's normal and it's human. Um, but for those who are, are prone to higher degrees, of, of anxiety or panic, uh, claustrophobia, those things, uh, we, we find patients may decide they need more and we can do that. Uh, we, we don't need to put patients to sleep. That's always a surprising thing for many patients is they, they ask or wonder, well, hey, can't you just knock me out? Shouldn't I be asleep for this? Um, and the answer is there's really um, not any ideal way to do this asleep because we need uh, some level of patient's cooperation of looking straight ahead at a light, um, not seeing anything scary, but um, but we find that as they get through it and once they're done, so many afterwards end up saying, wow, that wasn't so bad after all. I was really nervous, I was really worked up about this, and really it was that quick, I didn't realize. you know. And, and so, um, so luckily, very pleasantly surprised generally. Now, remember guys, if you are liking this video and you're learning something, please don't forget to hit the like button below. Now, we had talked about um, pressure, we talked about quickness, how long does the actual procedure take? Mm -hmm. So generally we describe it as being roughly about a few minutes per eye, but that includes even just the positioning, lying down on the bed. Uh, when we really get down to the details of the laser steps, it's even faster. We're looking at uh, with modern lasers, such as the one we have right behind us, uh, the, the first step, the flap creation step is about 16 seconds. Um, the second step, uh, the reshaping or the uh, prescription change step uh, is generally most patients less than about 30 seconds. So very, very fast for the actual laser step. So a lot of the rest is really applying drops to the eye, lying down in the bed, getting you positioned, uh, really not anything scary. And even these laser steps um, don't generally tend to be scary. One of the modern developments with LASIK uh, has been uh, where once upon a time there was more, more pressure, for example, that people might feel. We use, uh, with the laser behind us, a version that has such low pressure, people don't even report pressure any longer, which is pretty neat. Um, so, so it's come a long way. Uh, now, I did want to kind of go into a little bit about how this procedure is done. Now, I will say there are a lot of videos out there already on YouTube of actually what, either you can watch the procedure being done to an actual real person, or if you're a little more squeamish, you can watch an animation, or if you're even more squeamish, then that's what this video I think will be for. So can the simplest way, uh, can you just describe how the procedure is done? Sure, yeah. Um, so for LASIK, uh, just so start to finish, uh, we have you lie down on a, on a bed that would rotate between uh, lasers uh, just behind us. and. Uh, uh, once in place, we give a series of numbing drops. Uh, that, that's all that's needed, no needles. Some naturally ask one or that, or you give me shots or injections, no. Uh, numbing drops to numb the eye. Uh, next, uh, the patient would be really just looking at a, at a light or a series of lights. Um, 
uh, for that first step. Uh, really, the laser uh, doesn't tend to even create any sound, so very quiet. Uh, again, uh, laser flap creation step occurs within about 16 seconds. Uh, we'll treat one eye, often then go ahead and treat the other eye. We then rotate in the bed to the, the second laser. This laser just below the flap surface uh, changes the curvature of the eye. Um, so again, series of drops along the way, still continuing to keep the eye numb. Um, finally, once that's finished, uh, a round of drops that are to you know, help calm the eye and somebody's able to get up and, and, and walk out of the room. Uh, the vision, you know, people will describe the vision as having a foggy quality to it there initially and uh, generally they describe that fogginess as clearing uh, in a large way overnight. My last question, uh, it can kind of go to both of you also, but um, I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Austin. Uh, how do you set your patients up for the greatest su success that you can have What's something that they can do before the surgery, maybe after the surgery? So I'll say before the surgery, what would you have them do? And after the surgery, what would be a good option or good things for them to do on a routine basis to get the most out of this procedure? Um, honestly, I would say there really is very little you have to do um, in order to prepare or really to kind of maximize the benefits of the surgery. Kind of we do that work for you. You know, as your optometrist or as your ophthalmologist, mm -hmm. we're gonna guide you in a way that you really don't have to do much in your part because we wanna make sure that we minimize any risk of you, you know, reducing the quality of the surgery. There really is very little that you can do on your part to alter or reduce the quality or effect of the surgery that you're going to have. The main thing as Dr. Shana was asking is, you know, when it comes to the contact lenses or the glasses that you wear, you know, just making sure that you're staying out of those things for the amount of time that has been recommended to you by the doctor after having the procedure done. This is the most important part. And to go to what you're saying, as far as the actual procedures afterwards, getting the surgery done and then actually the healing process is where it's most important. Making sure that you're following the drop regimen as you put on, making sure that you're listening to all the instructions and the directions that your doctor has given you. That's gonna be the best mm -hmm. way to really heal up the best. And where we find some, if any, complications usually comes in that part of the process. So as long as you follow the directions as you're given, you shouldn't have any issues. Um, in terms of those directions afterwards, uh, which you might be alluding to, you know, those, you know, some of the main precautions that first week, we do tend to avoid touching and rubbing of the eyes. Um, we avoid, uh, you know, contact sports where we could get hit in the eye, avoid swimming generally uh, for about a week. Eye makeup we tend to avoid for about a week, mostly because removal might involve us rubbing the eyes, uh, things of that sort. So those are a couple of the main precautions we take in the first week after LASIK. Um, but but I agree uh, fully that um, a lot of it is just simply following some of these instructions that are given to you by your doctor. So we went through a lot of stuff about LASIK in this video. This is a little longer than what we want for most of our videos in the future for other procedures, but this is one of the most commonly asked procedure. So that's why we went a little bit long on this. So, but if you do have any other questions or concerns that we didn't bring up today, make sure you do put that in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer that for you. We're not trying to hoodwink anyone or trying to uh, fool anyone. We want to have full uh, honesty and disclosure with any of this stuff. Cause remember, these are your eyes. They're not our eyes. They're yours. We do the best that we can to help you keep your eyes happy and healthy for as long as you can, but they are your eyes and you are the one that's gonna make that final decision. I appreciate you guys for helping me out with this video and keep watching out for more videos by for one, subscribing, two, hit that like button. Well, you can do that anytime, but make sure you do hit that uh, bell icon so you get notified when we bring up the next video. And then, then in the next video, we'll be talking about PRK. Well, I hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Stay well, stay focused, and we'll see you next time.